Gospel, uh, once again to Luke chapter 6, and those 11 verses that we have um, already encountered. Who, um, the question, um, who um, are the actual lawbreakers here? That's the question that we ask and the question that um, we will answer, hopefully. There is, uh, with Luke's gospel, um, uh, he does not record his gospel in, in chronological uh, terms, you know, in, in, in time factor. Uh, Jairus' uh, daughter would normally be inserted here but look, he deals with that much later on. And what he inserts here, uh, Luke does for his own purposes. It seems to me that what Luke does is he groups certain events together because there is a, a, a sort of common um, theme or common thread, if you like. And of course, uh, what is happening here is just another attack of the Pharisees and scribes, the Jews, the religious hierarchy uh, coming against the Lord Jesus Christ here. In fact, we have two separate occasions uh, recorded in these um, 11 verses. Verse one, and it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first. And then in verse six, a separate occasion altogether and it came to pass also on another Sabbath. So it's two incidents and it's the same uh, forces that are coming against the Son of God and the charge on both occasions is the same. It's that of Sabbath breaking. That is of breaking the moral code, the divine law of God which of course is a charge of great severity. Because remember that um, who we're talking about here is the Son of God, is the Son of Man, is our Lord Jesus Christ, our sinless Savior. Now, if these charges are true, uh, that are indicted against him here, then that means, that would mean that he is no longer sinless and that would mean that he could no longer be our savior. He would be accountable for sins of his own. And of course, could account only for his own sins and certainly not for that of others ourselves. But of course, it's, that's not the real issue, is it? That's not what the, the problem is with these Pharisees and scribes, these doctors of the law. The problem is Jesus himself. It's his person, you see, um, that they hate and despise. They cannot stand the sight of him. It's his authority, you know. He comes speaking as one who has authority, not as the scribes and Pharisees. But I say unto you, he says, as he goes through the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it said of old. That's not a reference to the Old Testament. That's not a, that's not a reference to, to the commandments, to the law of God. When he says, you have heard it said of old, he's talking about what the Pharisees, what they have been relating to them from former uh, rabbis, and teachers of the law, you have heard it said, but it is not true, it is not in accordance with the divine law, but I say unto you, I, the highest authority that there is in the universe, in the world, in eternity, I, the Son of Man, I say unto you, and they hate that authority with which he speaks. And of course his uniqueness as God's full and final revelation to mankind. Jesus is God's last world, word, sorry, to a world of ruined sinners. You reject that final word and you reject God, finally. 
And so the issue is one of fear. They're afraid of their position. They're afraid of their own authority because men and women are flocking to hear the Son of God and their hatred for him. And so they come with this double whammy, this double charge of Sabbath breaking, uh, contravening the law of God. And as you read the gospel narratives, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, you see these men constantly harassing the Son of God and coming after him. And you see that conflict is inevitable. It is building up like a storm ready to break. And as the storm gathers, the hostility builds up and gets stronger and stronger. He's testified, if you go back uh, to the previous chapter, to verse 14 of chapter 5, and he charged him to tell no man, but go and show thyself to the priest and offer for thy cleansing according as Moses commanded for a testimony amongst them. He sends the healed man back amongst the religious hierarchy as a testimony, a testimony against their unbelief and their impotent religion. And they have no answer for it. They accuse in verse 21 of blasphemy and the scribes, the Pharisees, began to reason, saying, who is this? which speak of blasphemies, who can forgive sins but God alone. They accuse him of blasphemy, but of course that's a trumped up charge as well because he is, as he tells us here in our passage this evening, he is the son of man. That's not a reference to his manhood. That's not a, that's not a reference to his human nature. That harks back to Ezekiel. That harks back to Daniel chapter 7. The son of man, the ancient of days, who has an everlasting kingdom. That's a testimony to his deity. It is God Almighty manifest in the flesh who stands before them and pronounces that forgiveness. And then they seek to censor him, verses 30 through 33. But their scribes and Pharisees murmuring against his disciples, saying, why do, you, why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Again and again and again they come at him. Seeking, looking for some excuse, looking for some reason, looking for some flaw that they can bring an accusation, that they can bring a charge against Jesus. And now here, verses 1 through 5, we have this accusation of lawlessness. The phrase, the second Sabbath after the first is a is a, a strange uh, an anomaly, it seems. Uh, the Greek word in the, the original New Testament, well, it translates literally second first. It's a word not repeated again in the scriptures or in on classical Greek uh, writing. Opinions are divided as to what it means, but it seems uh, that what is meant simply by it is it was the... Um, the second Sabbath after the um, after uh, a previous um, the first Jewish festival of the month, but the state of grain, the state of the grain, is sufficient. Tells us all that we need to know. The actual incident here in verse one: It came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the cornfields. And his disciples plucked the ears of, of corn and did eat. Nothing wrong with that, right? Here comes the charge. Rubbing them, rubbing them in their hands. That's the issue. That's the problem. Yeah? It was the Sabbath day. Yeah? It was the Sabbath day. The disciples, they are hungry. That's insignificant, that doesn't matter. They're, they're, they're not suffering from malnutrition. They're just, they're, just simply, um, they're, they're just simply hungry. 
That's, that's not an excuse for violating God's law. The state of the grain tells us it was sometime mid to late April because uh, the, the corn is, is ripe. And they're walking through the cornfields. Um, we would imagine perhaps maybe a pathway between two fields. And, you know, they're walking along and quite naturally they're hungry. They see the corn, they pluck some of the grains of corn, rub them in their hands and, and of course, uh, consume them. We wouldn't imagine for one moment that the Lord Jesus and his disciples would be trampling through some farmer's field. And of course, well, you might say, well, wait a minute, there's another charge involved here, surely, and that of theft. It's not their corn. Well, that's covered too in the divine law. If you went back to Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 25, where God's law says, when thou comest into the standing corn of thy neighbor, then thou mayest pluck the ears with thine hand. But thou shalt not move a sickle unto thy neighbor's standing corn. You get it? You can pluck the farmer's grains of corn, but if you bring your combine harvester into the field, then you are breaking the law. It's the fact that it's done on the Sabbath day. That's the problem. That's the issue. That's where the accusation comes from in verse 2. Certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? These, the enemies of the Lord, are constantly dogging his heels all the time now, looking for an excuse, looking for a reason of accusation. And this is their accusation. They act as though they are absolutely outraged. How could you possibly allow your disciples, your men, to do this on the Sabbath day? Outwardly, you know, raging. But inside in their hearts, they're absolutely delighted. Because we've got a charge against him now. Because anything that the disciples of Jesus do with his silent consent is as good as done by him. You see? And the charge, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, contravention of that Sabbath law. But of course, they don't mean that Sabbath law as you and I would understand it. What they're talking about is their own tradition. You see, they have their own pharisaical, they have their own uh, Judaistic uh, code, their own, if you like, uh, 39 articles, you know, a code by well, <laughs> many more than 39, believe me. And it's this rubbing, going back to verse 1, it's this rubbing the corn in their hands. If they simply plucked the corn and, and ate it, there would be no problem. But according to their pharisaical code, to plow, to sow, to reap, to bind, to thresh, to winnow, to grind, all these are against their code, you see, of conduct on the Sabbath day. So Jesus answers them, verses 3 through 5. Answering them, said, have you not read so much as this? What David did when himself was hungered, and they which were with him, how he went into the house of God and did take and eat the showbread and gave also to them that were with him, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone. And he said unto them that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Jesus illustrates his point, his principle. Uh, he's going back to 1 Samuel chapter 21. Have you not even read this? You see? Uh, Jesus, he very easily and very simply proves that he and his disciples are well within the confines of the divine law. But yes, yes, against their code, their additions to the divine law, I mean. And he brings out the fullness of the principle that's involved with this incident with King David back in 1 Samuel chapter 21. Have you not read, he says... Have you not read so much as this? 
Is it a, um, you know, is it a barb there? You know, haven't you read even this much of scripture? Or oh, oh, plenty of rabbinical reading. This was their teaching, you see. This was their authority. When these Pharisees and scribes were teaching the people, they, would, they wouldn't be quoting the divine law. They wouldn't be quoting 1 Samuel or Jeremiah or Isaiah. They would be quoting Rabbi so-and-so says such and such. Haven't you read even this? Maybe, perhaps, maybe a... Maybe a superficial reading of 1 Samuel 21, a cursory, cursory glance at it, you know, superficially, and just passing it over without giving any serious thought as to what took place there. They failed to see and to understand the principle upon which King David was operating. They have, you see, they had only a fractional view of Scripture. And that is a very dangerous thing. David, you see, and his followers, uh, you recall the occasion when he's fleeing from King Saul. And he wants food from Ahimelech, the priest, and uh, for he and his men. And he wants uh, some weaponry, some, some armor and, and a sword. If you recall, he was given uh, Goliath's sword. Well, David and his men, you see, were not starving. They were not suffering from malnutrition either, as were the disciples of the Lord Jesus. They were hungry. That's enough. So what did David do? Well, his conduct, you see, rests upon the principle, and this is important, this principle that in exceptional cases where the moral law and the ceremonial law yeah. When the two of them clash, the latter, the ceremonial law, must yield to the moral. Because the ceremonial is simply a rite, R-I-T-E, and the rite is just simply a means, whereas the moral law is the end. So when there's a conflict between the two, it's the end, it's the moral code that takes priority. But with this crazy Phariseeism, they were always prioritizing the means, the right, above the moral code. God's concern is for the heart of man. God's concern is for man. The Sabbath law, the Sabbath principle is given to us for man and for man's benefit. Now, if King David's hunger, he and his men, if their hunger can lay aside a divine ceremonial regulation, then the disciples of the Lord Jesus, their hunger can certainly lay aside the rabbinical notions of these mad, crazy Pharisees. Or they could do it when it suited them. If you turn over a page or two to Luke's Gospel and to chapter 13 and to verse 10. <coughs> and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift herself, lift, lift herself up. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, art thou loose from, from thine infirmity? And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him and said, Thou hypocrite. Doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years, be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day? Damnable hypocrites. That's all they were. 
Their code meant nothing when it suited them. But there's an even higher principle involved here. Verse 5. And he said unto them that the Son of Man, God, the Son of Man, is Lord also of the Sabbath. Even if he had, and he had not, but even if he had contravened the Sabbath law, there would be no guilt attached to him because the Son of God, the Son of Man, has the Sabbath at his own disposal and his men are in his service on the Sabbath day. But rest assured that the Son of God along with the Father and the Holy Spirit who instituted the Sabbath principle for man's benefit would be the last, would be the very last to violate that principle. So secondly, we have the actual fulfillment of the law, verses 6 through 10. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. Here is Jesus once again. It's his habit. It's his custom. He's in the Lord's house on the Sabbath day, uh, where we should be too. And uh, here is a man with a withered hand, it's, it's so deformed, it's so broken, it's so useless, it, it, and it's beyond, in medical terms, in, in such days as these, it was beyond restoration. And there are these holy, holy uh, Pharisees and scribes, and they're in God's house, but they're not, alas, they're not there to worship God, they're not there to praise the true and living God, they're there watching this man to see if they can find an accusation against him. Most holy business, huh? Will he heal or will he not? Will we get him this time? Their question, you see, was always, 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 is it legal? Is it lawful? Yeah? Is it right? They never, the question never entered into their heads, is it merciful? Hmm? That never entered into their thinking. So, the answer that Jesus gives is that, you know, that the actual fulfillment of the law, the divine principle, of the Sabbath law, is positive, not negative. The Sabbath principle was instituted for the blessing of mankind. And prior to being sanctified as the Lord's day, you know, as part of the Mosaic law, it was given way back with the creation mandate, Genesis chapter 2. For the Jews, you see, their Sabbath day was a glorious opportunity. An opportunity to show to all around them, you know, that they were God's people. Isn't that a testimony that's needed today amongst, you know, professing Christians? I mean, isn't it a testimony, you know, that, that when, when your neighbors, you know, your, your friends and your neighbors, when they... they, they they, they see you coming out to church with your Bible in your hand. They know where you're going, you know. And, and, and when Monday morning comes and the discussions at work, you know, what did you do, like, you know, and, and the weekend's opportunities and activities. Are they no better than the world, you know? It, did Manchester United beat Manchester City? Or, or, or you know, or, or, or who was playing golf, you know, or... or what was on the, the, the television, you know. Now, I, I, I was amongst the Lord's people praising and worshipping God 
It's positive. It's a time, beloved, it's a time to be to come apart from the world and all its activities and to be with the Lord, to worship and to pray and to listen to and to read the word of God, to be in church amongst God's people. Negatively, it needs we need to guard against the tendency for it to generate or degenerate rather into a slavish formalism that denies all humanity. The man here responds to Jesus, verse 8. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up, stand forth in the midst. And he arose. He arose and stood forth. He stood up. Notice, will you please, the man did not ask to be healed. That's not what he came for. He was amongst God's people. Maybe that was his custom too, to be there on the Sabbath day. He just happens to be there. He did not ask for, for this healing. He was singled out by the Lord Jesus Christ himself, sovereignly and freely. So those who advocate that there must be faith for healing, well, they have no, um, they have no basis for that here. This man is totally, completely passive. He's a man who's caught between two factions. He's caught between heaven and hell, between Jesus and the Jews, between right and wrong. Jesus knows what they're thinking and he makes for a very, very dramatic scene, a very tense scene. And I don't doubt that as this man stood up that a great hush fell upon the room. It's the spirit, you see, it's the spirit, not, not the letter. In irony, verse 9 he asks this question. Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Tell me, he says, tell me, is it lawful in the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? Is it actually come to this that I have to ask you this basic question, you who would be teachers in Israel, and I have to ask you this simple basic question, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day? Jesus is by no means abolishing the Sabbath principle. Just as in the previous incident, in the previous chapter, he was not abolishing fasting, but rather instituting a spiritual, a proper spiritual observance of the Sabbath principle and the cessation of their slavish, legalistic observance. an observance of the principle that meets the inward needs of man. You see, the Sabbath principle was given for the welfare of man, and where the welfare of man and the Sabbath rest clash. Hmm? When the welfare of man and the Sabbath rest clash, the latter, the Sabbath rest, must yield. Because the Sabbath was given for man, man's welfare. The Sabbath is for man. And that will stand as long as this earthly economy stands. And the question to save or to destroy, to destroy life, he takes it to the ultimate extreme. Maybe, perhaps, I don't know, Jesus is mindful of the real intent of these men, their heart intent, to actually murder him. He goes to the highest point of moral excellence, and that is to save life. And the opposite is to destroy, is to kill life. Jesus could have taken a child, a young child, out of that congregation if there was such a one there. And he could have set that child in the midst of them. And he could have posed this question to that child and he would have gotten the right answer without the batting of an eyelid. 
but anything but silence would have convicted and condemned they themselves. Jesus shut the door on them and they had no escape. It's right, it's wrong, not wrong. His eyes pass over the congregation, verse 10, and looking around upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand, and he did so, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. As his eyes pass over, as he gazes upon them, doubtless the tension builds up as he waits for a response from just one single person. One single person. Is it right or wrong? Not one. We told him Mark's gospel. And when he had looked around about them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said unto them, unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. The hardness, the obduracy. He simply commands, and it is done. And this withered, blasted, deformed hand is utterly restored to a pristine condition. A glorious, shining work of the almighty power of King Jesus. He didn't touch the man. He didn't say anything. He just told him to stretch forth his hand. And not the most rabid of Pharisees could call that work. On the Sabbath day. He was simply healed by the mighty will of Jesus and that alone. And with great mastery, he cuts off every escape route that these Jews had. So who, who are the breakers of God's law here? Verse 11, the active and willful violation of the command. And they were filled with madness and communed with one another what they might do to Jesus. You would think this act of kindness, you would think they would all be rejoicing. You would think they would all be uh, maybe even clapping, praising God. Look at this, the man's hand has been healed. He's whole. Well, you would think, Maybe not that. Maybe you would think, well, at least they'll desist. At least they'll relent from this, this hounding of Jesus. I mean, this care, this compassion, this kindness. No, on the contrary, what it has done, it has robbed them of their grounds of accusation against him. And so it only serves to anger. It only serves to enrage them the more. Oh, it was wrong for Jesus to heal on the Sabbath day, but it wasn't wrong for them to be there in God's house spying upon him. It wasn't wrong for them to be sitting there burning with rage against him, murderous rage. I suggest to you that they are the ones actively and willfully violating the divine commands of God. They are consumed with madness, filled with madness, more, much more than anger. Their sense and their reason has gone out the window. And the more sensibly, the more rationally, the more intelligently Jesus seeks to speak to them and deal with them, the crazier they become. And you see how the very presence of Jesus and the work and the word of Jesus, you see how that it reveals? You see how it brings out the natural state of the human heart? Hmm? The truth and goodness and salvation of God ought to have the opposite effect, ought to have men rejoicing, ought to have men trusting in the Son of Man. But alas, this is the condition of all men, is it not? Because they're naturally born into this world. I mean, when men prefer the law, when they prefer religious law to the lawgiver, surely their sin is exposed. 
to these men the law was an end in itself. It was something for them to guard. It was something for them to use to manipulate other people, to put burdens upon other people that they themselves could not endure. To administer to others. Beloved, the law is a servant of grace. It's our schoolmaster. It could never save us. It could never restore us to God. It was given to lead us to Jesus Christ our greatest need. But of course you can't manipulate him and that's why men prefer the religious laws. So here they are conspiring to mischief. Still in verse 11, they communed with one another. They're conspiring together how they might get rid of this man Jesus. For you see, when Jesus took the initiative there in the Sabbath day in that synagogue, when he did what was right, and remember for him to have done nothing, that would have been evil. Hmm? When he healed that man in the Sabbath, on the Sabbath morning in that synagogue, he signed his own death warrant. I'm sure you've seen how religious folk can be as angry as hell when you begin to interfere with their religion. Just watch our Islamic friends for a short while, you'll get the picture. So blinded, so blinded by their idolatry to the law. Their code, that is. You know, they fail to see that Jesus was more devoted to the law than they ever were. They, he fulfilled the law. He fulfilled all righteousness. All they did was simply observe it. It was for other people to do the obeying. So you see how that they plotted, they schemed, they conspired murder against Jesus on their Sabbath day, a most holy business indeed. This beloved constitutes murder. Because Jesus tells us, and will tell us in later verses in the same chapter, that the lust and passions leading to actual murder. The anger. Matthew 5, 21, you have heard it was said by them of old time. Thou shalt not kill, whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you that, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. The anger in men's hearts against their fellow man, you see, is as wicked as the actual act of murder. It's the sin of the heart against the fifth commandment, thou shalt not kill. Anger is equal to murder and makes us worthy of hell. So you see, they've already violated God's command or God's commands, all of them. They had already murdered the Lord Jesus long, long before they got him to the cross. So, is it possible for a Christian to become so religiously hidebound, you know, with rules and regulations? They ask you, what's, what's, what's important? What's, what's important to you, the rules or the ruler? Hmm? You see, see the, here the destructive, destructiveness of this utter legalism? Jesus, he saw the thoughts, he saw the intents of their heart, he knew, he knew what they were thinking about him, about his authority, about his work. He knew their thoughts. And as he gazes round the room here this evening, amongst us, what does he see in our hearts? For him. 
Do you love him? Do you love him? He's altogether lovely. Jesus was perfectly innocent of the accusation brought against him by these Pharisees. He had not broken God's law. Never once did he break God's law. He is the sinless son of God. But you're not. I'm not. None of us are. We're all guilty. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all broken God's law, trampled it under. We're guilty to a man, to a woman. All of us. But you see, that's the very reason why Jesus came. That's why his father sent his son into the world. Jesus sent to be the savior of such lawbreakers. To call us out of the darkness and to call us to repentance and faith. Trusting him not in rules and regulations, not in religious activity, whatever it may be, whatever kind of variety, but trusting in him and in his finished, his completed work. And in his power to save. God sent his son, you see, to accomplish for us what the law could never, never do. And he accomplished it. In dying, in rising from the dead. Alive and alive forevermore. The lovely son of God who came to deliver us from all our lawless deeds, to forgive us, to pardon us, and to reconcile us to God through trusting him, loving him, who knew no sin, God's spotless lamb, slain from before the foundation of the world and in time on Calvary's cross, that there in submission to him, to King Jesus, that we might be healed and restored to God, forgiven and fit for heaven. Amen.